everything that I have, everything that I've acquired, every everything that I am is going to be gone at some point. The only way the creative world propels forward is by empowering others. So I have other people that are like a decade behind me in their career and also maybe in their life. I want to empower them. In this season of my life, as I've turned 40 and I'm looking on the second half of my career, because the first half is gone now. Like I'm 20 years in, the first half is over. I'm entering the second half. I, I really want to, to help others be at their optimal place, not just like in what they produce, but in who they are. Their character really matters. You know, creative culture, all these things, they really matter. And I want to help empower others into that. Welcome to the Winging It Travel podcast with me, James Hammond. Every Monday, I'll be joined by guests to talk about their travel stories, travel tips, backpacking advice, and so much more. Right now, I'm taking the podcast on the road traveling with me. So tune in every week for short form episodes detailing all my travels alongside my Monday guest episode. Are you a backpacker, gap year student, or simply someone who loves to travel? Then this is the podcast for you, designed to inspire you to travel. There'll be stories to tell, tips to share, and experiences to inspire. Welcome to the show. Hello and welcome to this week's episode where I'm joined by Dave Herring, who is a creative director, photographer, videographer, and writer and author. Today we're going to talk about Dave's creative projects but also how he mentors freelance creators to start and run their own businesses. I'm really keen to learn more about this area because sometime in the future, I maybe want to go into it myself. So Dave, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Feel good, man. Thanks for having me. Where in the world are you based right now? Yeah, so I'm in the Bay Area of California, which the Bay Area is like a lot of cities. Um, so I'm in the San Jose area. Okay, and for people maybe in Europe, that's like near... San Francisco. San Francisco. Yep. San yep. Francisco. When people say the area, they think San Francisco, but it's really like twin cities. It's San Francisco and San Jose and about 60 cities surrounding it. So we just all say the Bay Area. Oh, wow. So, you know, like the Golden State Warriors, they're based in the Bay Area, right? So what? Yep. What actual place are they based in? They're actually up uh, towards San Francisco, but okay. like the 49ers, when people think the San Francisco 49ers, that's yeah. actually here in San Jose. Well, so technically Santa Clara, but San Jose area, but they're nowhere near San Francisco, but they're the San Francisco 49ers. <laughs> so I think people in Europe have no idea about this sort of thing because like the 60 yeah. cities is crazy. Yeah, it was so many. And I mean, the Bay Area is so huge. We have, you know, around 8 million people in the Bay. And so like, I mean, it's just a massive part of the U.S. Oh, that's awesome. I do love California, I must admit. We did travel there this year. Behind me is Harris Beach in Oregon, just north. Nice. But um, yeah. that whole West Coast is dreamy, isn't it? Oh, it's it's amazing. I'm I'm originally from the East Coast. And uh, after many, many pilgrimages out here, we decided to move out here. So we love it. Is that a big rivalry, East and West? You know, it, it, culturally, it's, it's completely different. It's like being okay. in two different Americas. Um, but... Most of the time, people on the East Coast aren't thinking about the West Coast and vice versa as well. <laughs> like, it's just very different worlds. It's very interesting. Yeah, I, I love both sides. I don't really have a preference. But something about California and just that nice weather probably just tips it for me. That's that's the only thing. Yeah, the weather here is like, yeah, I mean, it's the only other state that matches, I think, the beauty of the weather here is like Colorado. They have a lot of oh, sunshine yeah. as but um, yeah. but we have we have it's sunny almost every day here, and it's not ever too hot or too cold. So I mean, it's just a uh, we get seasons in the bay, but um, they're mild, and you know this is this time of year we're a little gloomy, a little rainy, but for the most part, it's sunny every day. Dream. We're actually off to San Diego for Easter weekend. So what's that going nice. to be like? San Diego is like seventy five and sunny year round. <laughs> they don't have seasons. <laughs> just beautiful every day, like wonderful weather all the time green place can't wait to go it's probably like the only big city i've not been to big city uh on the yeah. west coast so i'm looking forward to ticking that one off and seeing it yeah yeah you'll love it awesome okay i like to delve into the history of my travelers on my podcast because sure. i've got a different different story and probably a different way of getting into travel could be early doors could be late on so mm -hmm. i want to know first of all where did you initially grow up and was there any travel growing up for you yeah. Um, so I am originally from a very small town in North Carolina called, I was born in a town called Kenansville, which no one's heard of. It's a tiny little country town. Uh, I only lived there for about five years and my family moved around a lot. Uh, we didn't move around a lot because it was glamorous. We moved around a lot because we were really poor. So, okay. so 
Uh, I, my parents eventually split. I grew up, I, I like to claim a town called Wilmington, North Carolina. It's a coastal town. It's kind of my hometown because it's the only place I ever had any roots. My grandparents were there. We went there all the time as kids and we eventually lived there after my parents split up. But uh, so I consider, you know, Wilmington to be my hometown. But we were pretty nomadic as a family, mostly, like I said, because of poverty. We were, I lived in 22 homes between the time I was born and the time I went to university. And so, and I was the first person in my family to ever go to a university. So, um, and that included even living in Germany. When I was uh, 15 years old, my family became military and we relocated to Europe and lived in Germany until I graduated from high school. I've always kind of had a sense of wanderlust. Uh, my grandparents, um, my grandmother is an immigrant from Rome. And so she left her home for a, a different life um, after World War II. My mother uh, is a pretty nomadic person as well, um, likes the idea of adventure. My mom would throw us in the car and drive us, you know, very long distances, um, but not, again, not always for fun. <laughs> but uh, even like today, my mom, who is in her 60s, she drove from the East Coast to the West Coast, which is about a 50 hour drive yeah. for the holidays just to be with us for the holidays. She could have flown in five hours, but she chose to drive it in 50. So she's always had a sense of being a traveler, wanted to see some stuff. And I think a lot of my travel love and wanderlust comes from that. Um, but yeah. And then as a, as a young adult, I did a lot of music and was on the road a lot. So I've always kind of been nomadic myself. That's awesome. I think I was reading your bio and I, I do have a similar path in that sense where we were definitely too poor to travel anywhere um mm -hmm. which i find interesting because if you travel abroad to other countries that are maybe not western uh, i think they assume that anyone can do it you know just mm. hop on a flight or whatever but actually there's a lot of people in these countries that can't do anything like that so it was right. never on the cards for me it was never even an option it's just i think survival for me was probably a little bit strong but it wasn't too far from that so the idea mm -hmm. of like getting on a plane going to germany or Anyway, in Europe for us was just totally off the cards. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And for us, like uh, growing up, we didn't really leave the, we never really left the East Coast. We really rarely left North Carolina. Um, but, you know, like I was a weekend road kid because my dad lived in one part of the state, my mom in another. So we mm -hmm. were used to being in the car for, you know, three hours one way on a Friday and three hours back on a Sunday and things like that, you know, and, uh, like, it's funny because as I've gotten older, um, I I like traveling by road less. <laughs> I used to love it. Like, really? Uh, but wow. as I've gotten older, <laughs> like long, long drives, um, I just, the longest drive I did in 2023, I was in, I, I drove from the Bay Area to Portland, Oregon for oh, yeah. three days. That's a 12 hour drive each way. Mm. And that kicked my butt. Like that was so long, <laughs> but you know, here, here's January and I've got several trips over the next like 30 days that are going to rival that. So, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> so interesting. Cause I love going on the roads and I tell you what Americans are good. I know they get a bit of stick for not traveling abroad. I get it. There's various right. reasons for that. But one thing they do do is get in their car and they do yeah, drive. Oh, they, they will commit to, like you say, 12 hour, rise to go to west coast or where it is just to have like a day or yeah. two as a trip and i think that's incredible yeah i think i think about a big part of that because i have some family that live that, that are italian um and i mean they they travel a lot uh from rome because they can hop on a flight for like 20 euros and yeah. go you know yeah. to, to istanbul or something but um yeah i think that one of the biggest things that makes the u.s interesting and i think part of our culture is i mean the u.s is a big nation we are, it's a very large, huge nation, um, especially compared to European nations. And as much as like Europe is fun to, to hop around and you get very different cultures, you get that in the US too. Like the West is very different than the East. The Midwest is very different than the South. You know, yeah. the Northeast, New England is very different from the Southwest in Arizona. So you have like, even though it's a big nation and very spread out, you get so much diversity and it's all accessible with our interstate system. And so like yeah. you can hop in a car very easily. And and also like I'm not a huge fan of like unchecked capitalism. That's probably not a conversation for your podcast. <laughs> but I one of the things that. that's done for the US is that I can get literally the same experience at Starbucks or whatever in any part of this country. Yeah. And that makes that makes traveling in the US a little more predictable. It makes it like 
You don't have to think about it as much. You don't have to think, hey, I'm going to be in another country with another language, with another coffee shop brand, with another hotel chain, with another, you know what I mean? Another yeah. whatever it looks like. Um, so traveling in the U.S. is is pretty easy for that reason. I think that's why Americans are more likely to hop in their car and drive eight to 10 hours, you know, to go do something. Yeah, a couple of things there I want to touch on because we drove across from Canada, right? So we went from mm-hmm. west to east and then we had to get back. So it's via the U.S. We do hop back to those days. I know some days were tough because we had an old camper van and there's no air con. And it's quite hot. Yeah. But the, the open road, I, can it be beaten? I'm not sure. The only thing I think we can compare it to that we loved was in Europe, you can do the train travel, right? You can travel in between countries right. with no visa checks. Uh, train travel is great as well. And then they're normally reliable. So I think those two are kind of the same, a bit different, but the same sort of idea. But driving on the open road in USA is a, I think it's a, a dream for a lot of, I would say, UK people, especially because I think we always see it as like a thing to do. You've got to go and do that. And I've driven, I've driven across 46 of the 48 states in the oh, continental wow. US. Yeah. Um, north, north to south, east to west. I, I've been all over this country in a car. And um, some states are much more fun to drive across than the others. Um, yeah. for, for me, when I was mentioning earlier, like I'm a little like less excited about driving today as I used to be. A big part of that in, in 2021, I was in a major car accident um, right here okay. in the Bay. And it messed my back up pretty bad. And so now it's like, I have to really consider, hey, I'm driving, I need to get to Oregon. I can drive 12 hours, which is honestly, it is fun because you can stop along the way. A lot of cool things as, as a photographer, a lot to see. But then I, what, what happens is it costs me like a day of recovery. You know yeah. what I mean? From sitting yeah. in a bucket seat for so long. And so I think, you know, my, my situation is a little unique. I think if that would not have happened, I'd be more likely to get excited about hopping in the car and, and to that during the pandemic in 2020, during the lockdown, I spent um, five, a little over five weeks on the road with my family. We were just driving around. We went to seven national parks um, wow. yeah. in the West. We just drove and we spent five over five weeks just on the road. And like, that was one of the highlights of my life. Like, so we drove, I want to say, um, I, mean, I don't remember how many miles or kilometers it would have been. It was, it was a lot, yeah. but um but yeah, I mean, so so yeah, that it is a dream. The open road, it's hard to beat it. Yeah, it's hard to beat it. And I think I got my car crash in early. I think I was eight. So that's when my was my bad yeah. one happened. So I think I got that done pretty early yeah. on. So I hear you on that because I was afraid of. Cars. I was I was thirty eight. Yeah, <laughs> so, well, different recovery. <laughs> Even now, I still hold on like to the just the handle. It's just a thing uh, from yeah. 20, 20 odd years ago. Yeah, strange. But the the interesting point that you said about the Starbucks. We actually got a little bit annoyed in the US with the same thing of Walmart, Starbucks. Yeah. There's no variety. And it's, it's weird when you think you don't need it, but you go, you go to Walmart, you can't find something. Oh, maybe the next Walmart will have something. No, nope, it's the same mm. over and over yeah. again. Different prices slightly, but that does get right. a little bit annoying after a while. It's a strange one. It is. And I think you have to be intentional about, like for me, when it comes to coffee, I love coffee. Yeah, Starbucks is predictable. And if I'm in a small town and I don't know what I'm going to get, like if I don't know, like how's this coffee mm. shop down here, then I'm likely gonna get Starbucks. Um, but a lot of the places I travel, especially in the West, the West, especially the Pacific Northwest, is known for its coffee. And yeah, so I, I never, yeah. I never get Starbucks if I'm in no. Oregon or Washington or even like Montana has amazing coffee shops. Like I, yeah. you can literally throw a dart and pick a random coffee shop and it's gonna be good. So, but but if I'm in like Paducah, Kentucky. I'm getting Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> that's how it goes. <laughs> yeah, we we found the the New England part and then the West Coast, Pacific Northwest, they're the best places for coffee. And that's yeah, a great coffee sure. in America. It's great. Like, and yeah. we, we did have a rule with no Starbucks. That is a rule. Mm-hmm. Uh, but sometimes you do need it. And we got to some random places in the Midwest where, well, at least it's got Wi Fi and aircon. Uh, I'll get a coffee. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. I love, I love the travel in the US. It's a, it's a whole beast in itself. Yeah. It's um, huge. And then, of course, you can fly it and also go to Hawaii and Alaska, technically. So that's a different mm-hmm. aspect to it as well. I, I may be crazy, man. I may be driving to Alaska on a road trip with some with some guys this summer from oh, the West Coast. It's on our list. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about me and two other guys. We're talking about doing an Alaska drive this summer. So, so you're going to go up the, up the five to the border? I, I think. I think what we would actually do is go through Alberta and then hit a hard, oh, okay. left, hit a hard west. We, we've been doing a little okay. research, read that like 
bigger mountains, better scenery for photography Unreal. is yeah. through Alberta and over, and then come yeah. back down the coast yeah. at a loop. Yeah, we we drive down the south of Canada pretty much on the border to Grand Forks and along mm -hmm. there, and that drive through the crow's nest to Alberta is unreal. So if you yeah. come from, I guess it would be Montana, right? Uh, yeah, through... Alberta is an amazing oh, place. Like, what there's place, nothing yeah. else. Like I'm the only uh, the only other place I could compare it to from like a wow factor is like the Southern Alps, like the Dolomites. And, yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like yeah. other than that, like especially if you're in North America, Alberta is probably the most beautiful part of North America. Yeah, that is a sensational place. Oh, that'd be an amazing trip. <laughs> that yeah. is something I would love to keep an eye on and see what you're going to go and see because there's just a plethora of different types of mountains yeah. and different types of topography. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. That's a long drive though, isn't it? <laughs> that's long. Yeah, I haven't even calculated the hours. <laughs> I wouldn't be doing all the driving. So, <laughs> and I think we'd be taking my buddy Sprinter van. So that would be yeah. a little more fun. <laughs> fair, fair. <laughs> when you were going into adulthood, so maybe you, you mentioned university as well. Uh, because obviously you become an adult, you get to know more of the world as you grow older. Right. Was there a more serious sense of maybe places that you want to see? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think like where I went to the where I went to school um, was a pretty secluded place on the East Coast. It was about an hour from the ocean, which is great. But um, but you know, to, to get anywhere fun and exciting, it was a drive. And uh, I played in a I played in a fairly successful band towards the end of my uh, college or university time and. We got booked all over the East Coast. And so, but we were also students. And so we, you know, cut out a class at like 3 p.m. on a Friday to play a 10 p.m. show six hours away and then drive back Saturday. Like <laughs> so we just got used to this kind of like road life. And I remember like um back then, I mean, I'm 40. So, you know, we're talking about the early 2000s in the transition between film and digital. Yes. So I did a lot of disposable cameras back then just for fun. Like I would just bring, pick up a, you know, disposable camera at the gas mm -hmm. station and then take photos along the way. Um, or then I had like early digital cameras where, you know, like the early little Nikon point and shoots. And eventually yeah. I think, I think it was a, uh, in 2005, I got my first like Nikon DSLR. It was a uh, D50 and it was like, I'm a real, I'm doing real photography now. And so that I always <laughs> had a camera with me. And I love capturing like the travel part yeah. of, of, you know, getting on the road and doing something and kind of documenting that. And I think that like photography for me has been like, uh, it's a motivator to go out and travel mm -hmm. and travel also lends itself to great photography. So it's kind of like both, both things keep me going. Um, and that's been, that's been true since I was a young adult. Okay. I've got, got to go into music because I have got a music degree, believe it yeah. or not. So I went to BIM in UK, which is a, equivalent to Berkeley, I guess, in in US uh, for yeah, four nice. years doing guitar stuff. Then I stopped because it was too much. I haven't played since, mm. which is quite a quite a stat. Wow. So what yeah, I haven't played. Were you thinking like you're in a band touring, that's gonna kick off or songwriting aspect or production mm. or sound engineering? Where, where are you thinking, do you think? Yeah, yeah. So my music journey has been kind of like all over the place. I, I actually started uh school to be a jazz major on saxophone. Wow. So okay. that was yeah. like my original thing. Um and I mean, I was like planning to do that. And I was going to be, and ultimately, if I couldn't cut it as a saxophonist, I wanted to be like a high school band director. That was like okay. the dream, yeah. you know, many years ago. Um, then I ended up going to school for, uh, you know, another kind of like other fields. And uh, during that time, I started playing guitar and because it's more practical. I wanted to jam with people. And yeah. there, in the early 2000s, unless you're playing like Dave Matthews band stuff, nobody's looking for a saxophonist. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> So in uh, jazz bands were hard to find in the little town I lived in for school. And so um, <laughs> so I started playing guitar and I actually started playing bass and then guitar. And uh, I actually ended up playing in some rock bands. And but the band that I was like really successful with was actually a hip hop band. Like, oh, OK. Hip hop with a live band. So we had a front guy who was like huh. a rapper. Okay. And then we had yeah. a DJ on turntables. I played guitar. There was a bass player and a drummer. And we had such a hype live show and original songs that like we had a lot of success. And uh, that lasted about two and a half, three years. As I came to an end, I started doing more of my own like songwriting and guitar. And then um, my my wife, she uh, when we got married, she is a piano player, but we got an accordion and because it's like a piano on its side. Yeah. And we started doing like singer songwriter stuff with a guitar and an nice. accordion. She's a good harmony singer. So we started doing all that together and that had some success for many years. And so I've kind of been all over the place as a musician, uh, but it gave me opportunities to, uh, 
to to really like travel and like there was uh in our early in the earliest days we were married in 2010 and the first few years of our marriage uh specifically like 11 and 12 we were on the road like 30 weekends in the midwest oh, wow. like a year we got you know we were we based out of minneapolis back then and um we would easily be all over the midwest every weekend with different mm-hmm. like you know touring things and then we were in the uh we got booked in like here in southern california and so we had to do all that kind of early on and that was awesome and all it was hard to make a living as a musician um if it's hard if it's hard like it was hard then i imagine it's even harder today uh just can continue to get more and more complicated um so yeah that's kind of my music story i started to realize probably yeah 2010 actually Uh, i think about it's halfway through when i was doing my degree that god this this is going to be really hard because the, the, the yeah. question I had is these amazing musicians that I'm learning of, I'm like, well, why are they teaching to a degree? You, you kind of think if you're that good, yeah. you should be not needing to teach really. So there must be a right. disconnect with making a living and being good. And when I realized, oh crap, I've got to be that good to even make a living. I, I kind of got disheartened really. And there's people yeah. now that I'm at, I was at college with who are still trying to do it like 10 12 years later and they're kind of like maybe what you were doing like touring a lot just about making a living but there must be a point where you have to analyze it and go either what's next or is it time yeah. to maybe try and change it up i'm not sure yeah i think the the biggest thing to be an independent artist and i'll just use the word artist because it can apply yeah, yeah. to music photography yeah. painting whatever it is is uh to make it today i think it's all about diversity of revenue a hundred percent You've got to have a lot of diversity to make it. So I've got a friend who is a full-time musician. He's my age. Um, he lives in San Diego. Um, he has had a career as a musician, and it's harder today than it's ever been. And he's getting older. So, you know, responsibilities. Mm-hmm. And he's single, no family. Um, but it takes he to make it as a musician. He's in all these things. He's in music, live performances. He's in the studio world. He also does portrait photography on the side. Like he is having to, and even though he has all this diversity, he still struggles to make it. And that guy's probably got at least 10,000 hours in his instrument, right? Oh, 100%. Sure. He's, a, he's a vocalist. Like he's an yeah. incredible singer, songwriter. Like he, do, he, he literally does everything right and still struggles to Tough. make it. Yeah, yeah, I think an uh, interesting point you made about what we were talking about earlier, about 10, 12, 15 years ago, compared to now, now would be, I wouldn't even know where to start. Because my dissertation, believe it or yeah. not, was 2012. And that was about Spotify was just coming in. Mm. So I thought I'd do a dissertation about how Spotify is going to change the game. Because in 2012, live overtook recorded sales for the first time ever. Mm. And it's been like that ever yeah. since. Yep. So I, th- I was like, oh, wow, that must be a reason. And now you get a billion things on Spotify. Is that going to get you anything? I'm not sure. So yeah. Yep. It's a different world now. Yeah, I don't know how to... Oh, totally, di- totally different world. And like in the success I had in 2006, 2007, never would happen today. Never. Yeah, yeah that's a tough thing as well, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I tell a lot of people like that I I don't really do much in the music world anymore. I do a lot, you know, obviously in the photography world, but mm. with, the, with the touring, but not like, it's almost like we, have, I feel like it's ingrained in us today that if it can't make money, we should do something else. Yes. But yeah. But like, that is a horrible, horrible idea. (laughs) Like, because like, I love music still. I still play a lot of music. In fact, I have a buddy and he and I, we just did a music, a big music project. It's the two of us this past, in 2023, we put it on Spotify. We put it out there. We've never promoted it. We've never, and we have like seven monthly listeners, but we loved it. It was fun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, And like, yeah. It's in me. I have to yeah. do something with that that's in me as a songwriter. And he's a great musician and songwriter too. So we collaborated. We do these projects together. They don't make money, but we still do them because we love it, you know, because it's art and we, it's inside of us to make it. And I, I tell people all the time, like, not everything has to be monetized to be successful. Yeah. And that's why people stop. I think I made a post end of the year last year about going to this year, how I saw quite a few podcasts stopping. I was like, oh, wow. I think. They probably lose heart because they're not monetizing. Mm. But I kind of made the point that you have to do it because you like it. Right. If you are just trying to get to that monetizing point, you just got to make decisions that are just based on that rather than what you want to do. And people just lose right. focus and lose passion for it. So this podcast, yeah. three years down the line, has decent figures, but like does not make any money. <laughs> I do lose money in terms of like subscription fees and stuff. So it's not all right. about money. Yeah, 100%. And, and not all the photography I do makes money. Uh, in fact, I would say the bulk of it doesn't. 
uh, what does obviously it sustains me, but yeah. I do way more than, than I actually get monetized and, and same with music. I don't make any money from music, but I still do it. And, you know, that's, if we don't create it, creatives have to create, whether yeah. it's monetized or not, creatives must create to be happy and be fulfilled and have, and feel alive. And I think that our culture today is like, monetize 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 and if it's not monetized do something else until you find the thing to monetize well i don't i just i don't i don't buy that lie well then you'd be changing every year because yeah. it's going to take oh years so i think monetization is a conversation to have if you're really committed to your thing so if you're, if you're t- five years down the line if this podcast is five years down the line i think there could be discussion to make oh how can i monetize i've been going a while weekly podcast there should be a a revenue stream that's fine because you put the hours in but if you keep thinking you do six months of this now nah, it's not made it let's do something else you'll just never stop yeah. and, and you'll never commit to anything either yeah my philosophy with it is like i have i have a lot of things going on at any time like different like because mm-hmm. re- different revenue streams or different projects the ones that spark and start doing something successful i'll go put gasoline on yeah you know what i mean like mm-hmm. like if, if i if, if you mentioned your podcast let's say like you're doing this because you love it. And then all of a sudden a, a sponsor comes and they say, Hey, we want to sponsor your podcast. We want to pay you $500 an episode. Um, and then you're like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm going to put some gasoline on that, you yeah. know? So, but not, not everything I do sparks. And yeah. so, but when something does spark, I'm very intentional about, you know, trying to fuel that fire. Yeah. I've got some questions about that. Cause I think you mentioned that in your uh, I think on the Podmatch site, you've got some things mm-hmm. to talk about. I've got yeah. some questions about that later on. So we'll come to that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I just quickly want to get into how did you get into, you mentioned music, but what about all the other stuff? So photography, uh, writing as well, and videography. Where do these things come into your into your life? Yeah. Um. So, you know, if I rewind, music was the gateway to it all. So everything else came out of necessity to trying to make it in music. So like okay, fair. back back when my band was in college, I was playing in when we were kicking off, well, we needed flyers, right? Because back then you had flyers and you had MySpace. Yeah, MySpace. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, I needed MySpace bio photos for our band. So you know what I did? I learned how to use a timer on a camera and get good shots and expose <laughs> it right. And, um, and then we needed flyers. So I learned how to design. Uh, we needed to run marketing strategies on MySpace back before you could do marketing on MySpace. So we would go on and we would add a hundred people in a zip code and try to make friends with them just so that they, you know, help promote our show. Like, so a lot of it was just like, I learned a lot of these things because we were trying to make it as musicians and we didn't have money to like yeah. throw to other people. So I couldn't hire a photographer. We could, we didn't have the money for that when we were starting <laughs> out. And so it was like, okay, we need to learn to take our own photos. We need to learn to make our own flyers. We need to learn even our, even our recordings, you know, digital recording was just becoming a thing back then. Mm-hmm. So I feel like we were on the forefront of that. You know, we were using cool edit pro back in the day and oh, uh, nice. yeah. trying to, you know, which is now Adobe audition, but yeah. you know, I, I do everything in pro tools now, but like we were, you know, trying to figure out how to do our own records. And, you know, we were, it was all just basically out of necessity. I learned all these other like, you know, creative mediums and, Today, I like to describe myself not always as like a photographer or musician. I just say I'm a creative. Like, that's what okay. I do. Yeah. Um, and that manifests itself in different seasons in different ways. Like for the past probably eight or nine years, it's been mostly photography driven. But for the past two years, videography has been a big part of my life where that wasn't several years ago. Writing has always been something I've loved to do. And um, and there was, there's been a couple of seasons where writing is like the thing I'm doing the most and everything else is in the back. And then there's other seasons where, you know, th- other things just kind of come to the front. But I, I kind of carry that label as a creative rather than like a specific thing because that creativity manifests itself in different ways. And do you self-taught all these things? Uh, yeah, self-taught. Love it. Uh, hard yeah. box, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say this: like, I didn't go to school for anything that I do creatively, but okay. I do sit at I do sit at the feet of professionals and try to learn and glean as much as I can from them. Mm. Um, I'm a I'm always listening, watching. I'm not afraid to ask questions. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not I, one thing. I'm not intimidated by other people. So someone might be a huge name, but if I get three minutes with them, I'm okay to, to introduce myself and say. Hey, like, I would just love to, connect. And, and I think this is a really important thing too. I feel like has been really good. Like with my career is I try to be relational first 
before I ask of anybody, anything like, how can I, what can I do for you before I ask you what, you know, what I might need from you. And I, I, I do not like transactional relationships. I think that that's a really bad cultural problem in our society. Um, so I try to just, you know, like not, not put myself in positions to take advantage of people, but I am, I am bold enough to, to ask. And it's funny because like nine out of 10 people are willing to tell you everything. If you just ask them. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's key. Like, I have no 100%. problems uh, with the podcast thing. Like it could be anything to do with audio engineering or sound stuff. I feel like I'm self-taught with that. You know, a bit mm-hmm. in the degree 10 years ago, but mostly self-taught. I need to ask questions. I need to learn more. So yeah. I have no problems with going to anyone. It's like, ah, oh, what was your thoughts on this? Because weirdly, I just do it. Like I have no idea if it's right or wrong or if it sounds good or not. It's a real big sort of throw it out there and see what happens. But I haven't got any bad feedback. So I must be doing something okay. Yeah. And I think <laughs> yeah. what you just said is so important. Like you, you got to be okay asking for feedback from yeah. people that are better. Like yeah. some, you have to be secure enough with yourself and where and with where you are to say, hey, I love your feedback on the work that I'm doing. Or what do you think about this? Like if you have two minutes and you could just tell me two sentences about this, what would you say? And that kind of stuff, it is amazing. And not everyone likes all your stuff. And finding out why is awesome. <laughs> it just makes you better. Yeah, I have no problem with someone telling me that it's just not their thing or not that good. Totally fine. I think I got a four-star review on Spotify. So that put my average down to 4.9. And then someone said to me, oh, you're a proper podcaster now because someone's given you a four-star, not a five-star. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll take it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and we're going to delve into some of these things we're talking about. Um, sure. a, a very interesting question I've got, uh, which could be re- relating to a lot of people here, is how do you find your creative purpose? How do I find my creative purpose? Mm. Um, I feel like every year I could give you a different answer on this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so right now, coming into 2024, um, I am finding that I used to think in terms of like projects that I that would like add value. So I value to me, I value to others. So like, if you asked me two years ago, or like, let's go back to 2019, what's that? Four years ago, now, five years ago now? Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wrote, I, that's when I wrote, I wrote a book. And um, so I would tell you, like, I'm just, I'm trying, like my purpose with this project is to inspire people that come from bad situations, have gone through traumatic things to go get healing in the outdoors, right? That was like what my book was about, basically. Mm-hmm. Spiritual healing in the outdoors. Um I would have said like my big purpose is that, uh, and then to 2022, I'd give you a different answer. Probably I would say like my purpose is to, uh, help inspire people. Cause I was doing a lot with tourism boards then to help okay. inspire yeah. people to travel and, yeah. and, and feel empowered to travel and today. What I'm really realizing is like my creative purpose is to take the sum of all that I am, whether it's things I've learned along the ways through success and failures, whether it's uh, resources that I have available to me that you might need, what all these things coming together, I feel like my purpose is summed up in the word like empowerment. Like mm-hmm. everything that I have, everything that I've acquired, every everything that I am is going to be gone at some point. You know, um, the only way the creative world propels forward is by empowering others. So like I have two children, I very much want to empower them. Right. But it's also have other people that are like a decade behind me in their career and also maybe in their life. I want to empower them. And so at this, in this season of my life, as I've turned 40 and I'm looking on the second half of my career because the first half is gone now. Like I'm 20 years in, the first half is over. Yeah. I'm entering the second half. I, I really want to, to help others be at their optimal place. Not just in what, not, not just like in what they produce, but in who they are, their character really matters, you know, creative culture, all these things, they really matter. And I want to help empower others into that. Just a couple of things from me please head to my new website, www.wingingittravelpodcast.com. The link is in the show notes where you can access everything about this podcast, how to support the podcast, where to find episodes, a little bit of information about me, how to contact me, how to sponsor the podcast, how to be a guest. Everything is on there for you to take a look at. And secondly, 
please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I've got weekly episodes coming out for all my travels for pretty much the last year and going a little bit further back. And of course, my future travels coming up in 2024. It would be great to see you on there. It helps podcasts gain that extra bit of traction. And I'm really enjoying showing you my content I have from the last year or so. Thank you. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Because I've, I've got this book in my mind I'm going to write right this year. A bit like you when you wrote your book in 2019. And that is just the 10-year anniversary, really, when I left Norwich, where I am now, to start this journey of living in four different countries, traveling to 50-odd countries. But like mm. the difference in person. So there is going to be travel stuff in there. Don't get me wrong. There's lots to, to cover in that. But I think yeah. the, the change in the person alongside the change of type of travel that I did. So he- hedonistic travel mm. in the early 20s to much more wholesome in the late 20s, early 30s. I think that needs yeah. to be documented. My purpose would be to show the progression of the human being, but also provide mm. some very interesting know-hows and what to do is when you want to go and travel parts of the world. So quite interesting. Yeah. yeah. I think if you if you prioritize your empowerment or your intrinsic worth of doing that. So that is you want to give people an idea of how you've progressed, then I think it's a good way to go about it. If you're just trying to do it like a book sale, it's never going to work, is it? Right. It's just, it's just not well, the and the book sale is transactional. It's hey, I yeah. did a thing, buy yeah. my thing to make my life better. Yeah. Now I try to look at those things as secondary to the value I'm adding, you know? A byproduct. Um, yeah, it's a, exactly. And and don't get me wrong. Like, I mean, we have to make a living, right? Yeah, I mean, we've got, yeah. to, we've got to sustain ourselves. I've got to support my family and all that. So this thing, yeah, financial stewardship and all that really does matter. Um, but what matters more, like money's fluid. You know what I mean? Money's yeah. going to come in, it's going to go out. But character is, it's, it's permanent. You know, mm-hmm. it's like people will never, people might forget how much money you gave them 40 years ago, but they'll never forget the interaction they had with you 40 years ago. You know, yeah, exactly. and that, mm. that that's really important to me. Yeah, I think it's the most important thing in life, isn't it? It's the connection. Yeah. Uh, or, or the community, if you like, if you've got a community of people. Right. Um, I think I mentioned my notes. It's a bit further on, but I'll say it now is that in the travel podcast community, very small. Uh, it's not it's not nowhere near the top podcast uh, genre at the top. You know, it's dominated by lots of other ones like news and sport. But that community is good. They generally do help each other. Uh, where people mm-hmm. might think it's a rivalry, but it's not. I think people are just trying to get people going on their journey and trying to keep podcasters yeah. going because a lot of people do stop. So I think it's, yeah, that community is very important. Right. Yeah, for sure. How important is it, though, to embrace and accept failure as a creative? Oh, man, it, I have got more lessons from failure than I have from success. Um, I think failure is the greatest tool we have mm. as creatives. Um, but failure only is a tool when you have personal security. If you haven't okay. done the heart and the head work to be secure in your creative, you know, in your creativity and in your own identity, then failure can destroy you. But if you do the heart work and the head work on the front end, when you're not failing, and let's just be honest, like we don't fail every day. Like we don't get up out of bed and go through the day and everything falls apart all day. Most of our days are pretty neutral. You know, we yeah. don't necessarily succeed, but we also don't necessarily fail. And so those are good times to be working on the self, on the heart, on the head and making sure that like we are in a good place. I do a lot of like self checks, um, even even still today, like in my, my education was in counseling. And so like um, I have, I, I did two two programs. One was like a, like, theological one and the other one was a counseling one and um and so i learned a lot of these skills as a young adult to like self check self evaluate but failure failure when a when a secure person fails they can say that sucked and they can be real about it it sucked it didn't work i'm feeling these emotions let me process these emotions but what what went wrong like there's this exercise i do what went right wrong confusing and missing that's mm-hmm. part of my daily, that's part of my project ebb and flow or an event ebb and flow. What was right, do it again. What was wrong, fix it. What was confusing, clarify it. What was missing, add it. And that right there is a good way to process all things, but it helps you identify the failure in context of also what went right. Because if you think about it, three of those things are fails. What was wrong, confusing, and missing. Yeah. But it's funny how the one thing, what was right, will offset all of that. As an example, maybe I've started my YouTube channel mid last year, right? So I fully accept I need to do consistent work, 
Uh, things will work, things will don't work, whatever. But it's got to take a long time, but long to keep chipping away and learning. That's a good way mm-hmm. to show the example, right? Because early doors, there's going to be no views, is there? Uh, or right. well, minimal compared to what you're trying to aim for and trying to build that community on there. It's going to take work, right? So I guess if you, it's a classic one today, actually. I, I released one yesterday and I thought, this is the best one I've done this video. And mm-hmm. it just didn't get anywhere near traction as the one last week. I'm like, oh, mm. it's just hard to analyze Isn't sometimes. It- but <laughs> yeah, 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 it's an <laughs> algorithm thing, whatever. But uh, but there is some maybe some things in there to learn about it and maybe implement next time. So I guess those sort of journeys, you can learn those things, right? But don't you think in this day and age, a lot of people are too quick to maybe if they get their failure, that's it. Well, it's done. Right. A hundred percent. Because we are conditioned, I feel like as a society, and this is global, by the way, not just Americans. Yeah, like, yeah, it, yeah. We, are, we are conditioned to reject failure immediately because it's personal and Mm. and and social media doesn't help with that because if you fail publicly if you fail like you put out your best video and it gets seven views in 24 hours (laughs) and everybody everybody can see it you know everybody it's got no views i should i should take it down i should get rid of this video because it's embarrassing to me you know what i mean it's like But that's where like, that's where the mind can go Mm. because you not only have not succeeded and I wouldn't even say you failed, you just didn't succeed. And there is a difference. Yeah. yeah. It's not black and white, but like, you know, you did it publicly and now people are going to judge you. So you see how like the mind can Mm. spiral and it's, and so therefore people are so quick to react to a not to non-success. I don't even call it failure, just to non-success that we start to label everything. And also like we're polarized people. Like we think in terms of black and white, everything, but I think 90% of life is super gray. <laughs> like it's super gray. Very gray. And because of that, <laughs> like it's hard to identify, you know, what is always like success and failure. Very gray, you mentioned yeah. YouTube. Like I, I launched my channel last year as well. Um, I launched a YouTube channel right at the first of the year. Yeah. And so I just wrapped my first year on YouTube and I learned a lot. Um, yeah. I learned a lot as well. And it's interesting to, like, there were times, especially in the comments, man. Oh my gosh. Wow. YouTube comments, people, people will be the darkest versions of themselves online, yeah. which I'm sure you know that. They are. But brutal. I had to process, I had to process one specific event. I, um, I made a video while I was in Italy this summer and I was super transparent and honest about uh, imposter syndrome. Cause I yeah. was shooting around Italy while balancing family, while balancing, you know, beings. I was, su- I got norovirus for like a few in Italy, which sucked. Okay. Um, so I made this video about imposter syndrome and how like it's easy to compare yourself and then, me- and then me- give yourself mental health issues. Right. Mm-hmm. So I was like really, tra- anyway, someone shared that on a Reddit group and that was like making fun of me. And then I got over 500 comments of people trashing me on that video. Oh, and man. I had to think, I had to, I had to say, do I pull this video or do I let their own receipts be my, be my defense, which I ended up keeping it up. Um, yeah. cause before that happened, I had hundreds of positive comments. Right. And then all of a sudden yeah, yeah. 500, yeah. 500, just awful things. And, um, yeah, it was really interesting. Like, you know, the mind, the mind can go to pretty horrible places if you don't like have some personal relationship with failure or with lack of success to be able to help you, to process those things in a healthy way. Oh, people are brutal, aren't they? Wow. Yeah. That's like a different level. Oh, that, it, it kind of disgusts me a little bit. There's a lot to unpack there for those people. Uh, yeah. I imagine those people are not doing what you're doing. So they're not even oh, in the sure. game. So yeah. how you can commentate on a game you're not even playing is just beyond me. And the lack of support is just, oh, it's just a really awful thing. And, and the, Reddit, the Reddit group is a very negative, like, they work together to troll people. It's yeah, not course. like, a, yeah. how you know sad I mean? is that, like, It's not like some real, like, critique. It was truly just like, hey, guys, let's all go troll this guy. You know, how sad and there's is like that, thousands of people in this group. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's, 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 it's looking back now, six months later, like, I laugh at it. Yeah, but in the day it was yeah. happening because they all happened in like 24 hours. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, I didn't even know where it was coming from until someone pointed out it was from Reddit and I saw the Reddit post myself. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it happens though. I mean, that's, that's the internet for you. And my, my friend who is actually coming to the podcast and her episode's next actually as we speak today, she just released a new book literally yesterday or the day before and someone's already given it two stars and then they've not even oh received the book yet. 
<laughs> She's like, they haven't even yeah. got the book yet, and it's a two stars. I'm like, well, yeah. what, what yeah, people, are people to do that? But I, I don't understand. They have a general lack of content in their own heart and in their of own course. head. Yeah. And so yeah. therefore they want to make everyone, you know, this that old saying, hurt people, hurt people, you know? Yeah. So that's how it goes. But then there was like one a review, which was three stars, so not much better, but it was a, I guess, a more constructive review, whereas like they described what they did and didn't like. So they also probably gave an honest opinion and that they are a reviewer, but this person gave two stars, no profile picture. Oh, it's just a, a weird person. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Always. It's always that person. <laughs> And kind of linking to this, do you have like a, a community of people that you've created where you can maybe go to for a bit of advice or even creatively? Or oh, I, absolutely. Like um, I try to I try to keep myself in a position where I have someone that's ahead of me and someone that's behind me always. Okay. Um, a lot of creatives, I feel like they they want to be the star or like they you know it's real, it's real easy to be to think of yourself as like hey I've got the goods let me let me tell everybody but you also need to be a student <laughs> and so yeah, like of course. yeah me I. I have people I talk to daily. Um, some are further along their journey. Some are behind where I am, but we all are very collaborative and kind and work, you know, work to encourage each other, inspire each other. Like um, it, it's, I, and again, like a lot of my creative friends are people that I've met because I admired them. And um, mm -hmm. And I thought, how can I, man, is, is there anything I can do? Can I like, if you come to the Bay Area, let me drive you around to cool spots, you know? And then they come and then I drive them around and then we hang out, you know? Yeah. And then we become friends. <laughs> like, it's like, you have all these, like, it's crazy how it all just like relationships come together. But I definitely have like the best community I've ever had in my life I have right now. I think it's key, isn't it? I think if you're creative, just, just to get that bounce back, mm -hmm. like your Reddit yeah. story. I imagine you probably ask, oh God, look, look, look what's happening here. Like, have, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah. I think you do need those people, right? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And the next question is the cultural values that fit into your work. How have you developed those over the years? Have they changed as well? Yeah, I think they, I think they have changed. I would say, or I would say they've been defined. Like, okay. Yeah. I may have always kind of done the same stuff, but never could tell you what I did. Um, today, I think I can articulate my cultural values. Like, um, probably my number, like my number two, one, my number one and my number two things as a creative are to be generous and to be grateful. Um, and that, that isn't even as a creative, that's like a, that's like a family thing we define as a family. Like we're always yeah. going to be generous and we're always going to be grateful. So we, like our, our kids are nine and six. That's part of our everyday language every day. Mm -hmm. Like, Hey, are we being grateful for this. Like when they're, you know, cause Gratitude is the opposite of entitlement, right? And so, um, yes. And so we want we we try to live that out in every area. But in my in my own creative work, like I, I do ask often, like how can I be overly generous in a in this situation? Or and it's crazy, man. Some of my biggest clients have come out of acts of generosity. I'll tell you a quick one. Mm -hmm. um, in 2018, I did a shoot in Zion National Park for myself wasn't a paid shoot, wasn't a client shoot. And I've done some work with the National Park Trust on the East Coast um, for um, Shenandoah National Park. And like, I've, I've got some contacts there, but I didn't ask for any of that. I went to Zion with my family, did my own shoots, had fun, did some landscapes. And then I was like, what do I do with these? These weren't for hire, but I don't want them sitting on my hard drive. And I don't want to just put them on Instagram. Like yeah. I'll put a few of them on Unsplash, which is like a free stock website. Okay. Okay. Um, so I put this, I put two or three photos on Unsplash from that shoot. Target reached out to me. Um, it was the art director for Target. They licensed that photo from me. They had it framed and it's available in all Targets across America. Oh, wow. And, huh. and I'm in my fourth year of license, relicensing that with them. Like that came because That's... I said, let me give wow. this photo for free. And here's the thing. They had every legal right to download that off Unsplash and print it, do whatever they want with it, because Unsplash is a free use license, right? Okay. And I could have walked in Target and seen my photo and never could have said a thing about it. Mm. But that's not what they did, because I do believe people at their core want to do right by others, mm. including major organizations like Target. Um, and like that, so that that just one example, like how generosity led to led to something really awesome. And I've got many stories about it. this is something that I was able to donate to or give my time to. And let me tell you what happened because of that. I, I can't like literally that's probably my number one career move. And all my biggest clients were those kinds of things.
I wonder if that person who got in contact with you from Target, is that a cultural value thing maybe personally or from the company, do you think? Do you reckon like if that person <sighs> who contacted you was, if their their boss said, oh, just take it. But then he was probably thinking, or she is thinking, oh, but that's not right. I better actually, yeah. we better pay for this. Well, yeah. whether it's a company or a personal, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, person. you're grateful for it. Gratitude. <laughs> that's and very interesting grateful. question though, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it is yeah yeah and it was a, it was a female uh, she she was so kind and i her first email i thought was spam or, or scam oh yeah yeah i was yeah. like target's reaching out to license one of my photos yeah right but <laughs> it was her name at target.com and then i looked her up on linkedin to verify oh yeah 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 i was like actually oh, this is real and yeah <laughs> check cleared everything went well <laughs> fantastic that's awesome and this goes on to the next question really as a freelancer and you're obviously a freelance creative what are some of the key components to survive in today's world? Yeah, good question. Uh, income diversity. I mentioned that earlier. Diversifying revenue is the number one way to make it because uh, not everything uh, is going to sustain in every season. There have been there have been seasons where I'm doing a lot of brand shoots, uh, especially in the high days of the Instagram uh, movement, which I think is over has been over for a couple of years now. But like, you know, the the product on an amazing location somewhere, you know, like I, I shot for a boot company. I took their boots all over the national parks here in the West. And I, they paid me well to take photos of their boots in, you know, Zion in Wyoming at the Tetons and Olympic, like they paid me great money, but that people aren't, that, that, that whole thing is dried up now. Like yeah. nobody's reaching out to me to do product photography in mountains anymore. But if I relied on that to support my family and I never pivoted, then we would be poor. We would yeah. be struggling, be homeless. Um, and so I think, you know, being being flexible and then acquiring new skills as market changes. Um, okay. For instance, three years ago, I didn't do any video work. Zero. I didn't even have a video setup. Today, one of my biggest uh, ongoing clients is a video client. I had to learn how to do video. And you think like photo and video is kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Nope totally different, mm -hmm. um, different set of skills, different set of tools, different set of gear. Um, and so, so I had to pivot. I had to diversify my own offering to say, I do photo and I do video. Uh, I also do this thing and that thing I consult for you. I can, and then I started a YouTube channel and the YouTube channel has done really well this past year. And, uh, but with the YouTube channel, I launched my own like digital products on my own website. And that has been a big, I never even saw that making money, but that became one of my biggest things last year. And so like, you just got to diversify because every day something could change. And if you're relying on that one thing to support you, your family, your lifestyle, and that one thing pivots, like the boots, for instance, I was, they were my biggest client in 2022. Um, that, that shifted. And when it shifted, they were gone. You know, they weren't doing that anymore. Yeah. Uh, and so you have to have income diversity 100% to make it as a freelancer. I guess alongside that is adaptability, right? Because you need to maybe take advantage of certain opportunities and adapt. So like you say, your video example mm -hmm. is great, but that's sort of- like, And that's why I don't market myself as a photographer because I market myself as a creative because it lets me contextualize what a client might need to what I can offer them. Because mm -hmm. I'm more than a photographer, you know? And I also do music production on the side for other artists. Like I, I mix or produce for them and I don't even, I'll even advertise that. You know, that's kind of like a word of mouth thing. That's just another form of the diversity, you know, of income. Mm -hmm. Okay. And was there any bits of advice that you were given that's still relevant to today? I know that's kind of the same potential thing as what we just talked about, but anything that kind of sticks. Yeah, to I'll add this, like another thing to make it as a freelancer is, and I, I, it's funny, I just, I just did a whole like post about this uh, a couple weeks ago. Like people that want to work with you, want to work with you, right? Mm -hmm. you, there's a thousand people that can do what you do. Like from a technical standpoint, you know, they get, they get better shots even than you're going to get, or they can make a better podcast or they can make a better painting or video. At the end of the day, you've got to be a fun person to work with, a life-giving person, not drain people. You you want you, it's like um, who do you want in your passenger seat on the road trip? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and be that person. Be that person that someone says, I want to take a road trip for 15 hours. Who do I want in the passenger seat? Your clients, like you want your clients to pick you, you know, and and not because you're gonna take the best photos or not because you're gonna, you know have the best thing for them, but it's because you're going to be the most like life giving person for them to go do this thing with. That's what I would say. Most of my client client work is it's that they choose me 
because I give them life. You know what I mean? I'm easy to work with. I'm try, I try to be fun to work with. I deliver what I say I'm going to deliver. I deliver it fast and on time. I get excited for them. They get, you know what I mean? Like all those things are how you can make it and how you secure clients. Oh, interesting. Okay. Cause I got my first like on the side client just for Christmas. Um, and he left a really nice review actually. And I, I think it's an Upwork. I got that off there, but um, he found me somehow. Um, but yeah, he said what you said there, like easy to work with, delivered on time. <laughs> I think he even said he's one of those rare people on Upwork that delivers mm. good quality work on, on time. Yeah. So I think if you get those sort of testimonials from people as well, that can really Right. Help. Yep, for sure. Okay. And how do you decide when to accept or reject work? Yeah, good question. I, I very much kind of like... Uh, I have, I have a master calendar for myself and on that master calendar, I, I, this is digital, but I also keep a yeah. paper version of it too. Cause sometimes I just need to write it down to think through it. Mm. For me, I think about time as equal to, if not more important than money. Um, mm -hmm. Because I mentioned earlier, like money is fluid. Money is going to yeah. come and go. Time is a one way street. And so the first thing that will disqualify a project for me is, is this something I want to give my time to? Mm. I I will say no if it's not something that I can give my time to, even if the payday is great. Um, I'll still say no because I have to number one, like think through my own personal time. Because the time I give to something else is time taken from something. Because that's how time works. It's mm -hmm. you give it to one thing, it's it's a zero sum. You know, it, it, another thing loses it. And so for me, I evaluate first and foremost the time part. Um, and then second, like, does this, is this on brand for me? Like mm -hmm. I'll shoot things that aren't on brand necessarily for me. Like if someone reached out and wanted, like I, I did a fashion week up in Portland back in the fall. I had never, I've done fashion before in terms of like, I've shot products, like pretty dresses on pretty girls, mm -hmm. but I've never done like a live event, like fashion week runway and all that. So I did Portland fashion week, which they booked me to come up there and that was fun and all that wasn't really on brand for me. And honestly, I don't know if I would do it again, but I mean, I'm, I'm open-minded to experiment a little bit, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, like it's time and is it on brand for me? Um, and, and you know, will it, will it move me forward or move my family forward? That's a big part of it as well. How difficult is it at the start though, if you're creative and you're trying to get your foot in the door in certain areas, is it, harder to say no because you need to get work under the belt i don't think it is i i think you you have to be you have to be sure of what you want to do at least at least like 75 percent sure of what you want to do and who you want to be on the front end and take yourself serious if you want to be taken serious mm -hmm. so for instance like i mentioned i launched a youtube channel a year ago right in january um all year long i had crappy brands reach out to me to shoot their crappy tripods or their, you know what I mean? Just like all these little brands you've never heard of. We make this great tripod. We make this great lens. We make this great battery, like all these things. So I send them back. Okay. My view or my channel gets an average of this many views. Right. Um, and here's what I charge per view on the front end. I came up with a very fair way to do it. Um, I, I take my last five videos and I average them all together. And I have a price per view that I think is reasonable and fair. Mm -hmm. And I send them back. I say, here's a quote for that. And every one of these companies are like, oh, we just want to send you the product. Mm. I'm like, so, and I just try to say, okay, so you want me to get the thing that you want to give me that I don't even want so that you can make money from my channel. That's not something I'm interested in. And now if I, and I'm thinking I am starting out on YouTube, right? I should take these things because mm. it looks like, Today's video is brought to you by blah, 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 you know, <laughs> but it's not, it's taking advantage of my viewers, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm yeah. committed. I am committed to providing or, or to not deceiving my viewers and to giving or telling them a product is great that I don't even want. Um, but it would be real easy to think, oh, I'm in the beginning stages. I should accept this thing. I should take that, you know, tripod that I don't want that's made out of plastic and tell my viewers how awesome it is because they gave me a free tripod. no. You stick to your, you stick to your guidelines, your values, define them on the front end. So you don't have to react to them. You know, you come up with all your systems before the offers come in and then you run your systems. And if you need to pivot, you pivot, right. Mm -hmm. But 
you have to you have to do this work on the front end so you aren't thinking I've got to accept all this stuff as it comes because that's how I'm going to make it. No, that's not how you're going to make it. You haven't made anything. If they, if you get a tripod for a shoot, you're not putting groceries on the table with your plastic uh, tripod. You know what yeah. I mean? It doesn't mean anything other than that company took advantage of your channel and your viewers. Hey, yeah, just a quick one. I just want to say there are many ways to support this podcast. You can buy me a coffee and help support the podcast with $5. Or you can go to my merch store with the affiliate link with T Public, where there's plenty of merch available to buy, such as t-shirts, jumpers, hoodies, and also some children's clothing. Thirdly, which is free, you can also rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, or Good Pods. Also, you can find me on social media on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. Simply just search for Winging It Travel Podcast, and you'll find me displaying all my social media content for traveling, podcast, and other stuff. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that's a great point. I think the only thing I can relate to to that is, is books. I've been giving loads of books to my podcast, and I've read them and done a podcast interview for free. But then mm-hmm. I started to realize, bloody hell, how long does it take to read a book? Right. And, yeah, and, 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 <laughs> yeah, and I've got to make notes. <laughs> so right. I, now I don't even do that for free anymore. And I think that's like a new thing going into 2024 is that the time is just, it has to be compensated for. And the turning yeah. point was one one guest paid me for an interview to interview her. And I thought that's so generous. And I thought, well, maybe there's mm-hmm. something in that. So I kind of pivoted to that. And that's now, mm-hmm. now my stance, if you like, on books. But uh, I do like travel books, don't get me wrong, but the the time is huge. So yeah. I think yep. you, you're right. You've got to be strong with these things because it is so easy just to get a free book. But like you say, a free book is great, but it doesn't put anything on the table in terms of right. lifestyle, like food or whatever, right? So yeah, you'd yeah, to, yeah. you're quite strong with that. And, and honestly, like... So many creatives think they have to do free work in the beginning to build a portfolio. And I also, I tell people all the time that I'm mentoring, like, no, you don't just take yourself serious on the front end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They'll take you as serious as you take you. Yeah. You know, if you're doing that, like there's wedding, like wedding photographers in the Bay charge what four, four to five, $6,000. And then people starting wow. out are like, I'll do your wedding for free. Okay. Well then you are doing a free wedding in the, idea that you're going to get portfolio images like rather just get some of your friends together and fake a wedding call that your portfolio <laughs> yeah. and move on. you know yeah. like 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 legit like why not like if that's what you need then do that but don't don't undercut the market by undercutting yourself you know mm-hmm. like take yourself serious on the front end um 90 of creative work comes through referrals um and that I made that number up, by the way, but that's my experience. <laughs> like, well, your experience. Like, that's, fine. that's not a real stat. It sounds good. But, uh, I'm, I'm I make up stats but, all the time. Don't worry. But, but all I'm saying is that like most work comes from referrals. The good old boy system is in every industry. So at the end of the day, like don't do all this free stuff and devalue yourself to mm. to start out and build to try to build something. No, just build the thing on your own. Like on your own with friends or whatever, with help. Um, and then, then take yourself serious. Okay. And you mentioned YouTube. So what have been some of the lessons this year that you learned? Yeah, I, I really learned what people are interested in on my channel pretty early on. Cause I was trying to make, um, a, a wide generalized topic on my channel, like talk about photography, but that's so general. What I learned is that in this season, when I make videos about the brand of camera that I use, I get way more engagement than if I make videos about how to compose on the field or how to okay. secure brands, right? Yeah. Gen- so, so it's like this, I can continue to make the videos that I want to make, but remember earlier I said like, I want to empower others, right? Mm. I can make my videos that I want to make right now in this season, be fulfilled with that and get zero engagement. Or I can make videos that people are looking for that'll help them along their way. So I I learned to pivot early on. And now every video I make is centered around the brand of camera that I use, why I use it, and examples of using it either in the field or, you know, things I've I've learned along the way about this system or whatever. And and those videos, like I just had one uh, I released two days ago. And then like my channel, I started it in January of last year. 6,000 um, plus no, subscribers. With, yeah, with no following, nothing. It's yeah. grown to 6,218 as of right now, which is yeah. awesome. Like 
Of course, I'm not Peter McKinnon with 5 million, but whatever. <laughs> you know. But like I released a video two days and four hours ago. That video uh, has had, um, how many plays are we at now? 5,300 plays, you know, which is awesome. Like, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Feels Amazing. like it was worth it was worth the time to make it. And it's on point with the camera brand that I'm using. But if I did that video and I didn't make it about the camera brand, I could have made the same video, given it a different title, tweaked it a little mm-hmm. bit, and it would have no engagement. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not helping other people. So I, I very much dive into like, what are people searching for in the world that I'm in? Uh-huh. You know, and I try to make videos that will empower others. And so I've learned, I learned early on to do that. And I think that's why I've seen, you know, any type of YouTube success, if you want to call it that. I don't know what success is in YouTube right now, but <laughs> but, uh, but I do know that like I'm very happy with the way my channel has grown. I'm very happy with the sales that I've generated from YouTube, um, and I think it's because I'm making stuff that people are looking for, rather than just like the stuff I want to make. Is your sales from the adverts, or just from people clicking onto your website and buying stuff? Yeah, clicking on clicking on and buying things directly from yeah. from my site. Um, and I mean every every day I have sales and I have had every day since April sales. And so like it's wow. become a big part of my life that I didn't yeah. see coming. And so mm-hmm. that's where earlier I was mentioning like where's the spark and put fuel on the fire. Yeah, yeah. Since yeah. that sparked, I've given a ton of attention to that and I'm continuing to do so like into 2024. Cause that who knows, a year from now, I might just be the guy who sells stuff on his website. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting because my YouTube journey is slightly different. I'm just in it for me, so maybe <laughs> I, I may be in this phase where I am still learning what what people who have subscribed to me actually do want to watch because they don't all watch. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, so yeah, because I've been traveling for a year, I've got a lot of stories and content to share. Yeah, but awesome. but, I'm, but I'm seeing it as more of a trying to inspire people to go to these places, but also personally <laughs> learn how to get these videos to a standard that. I like it to be, and that, that's a learning process. I'm still learning Final Cut Pro and how to add and change and edit. So I, I say it's a learning process and almost bonus territory. Yeah. Two things I've learned about YouTube specifically. One is that people are on YouTube to learn. That's we get educated on YouTube. Like, mm. so if I if I if I need to figure out how to do something, which I do all the time, I go to YouTube. Like even yeah, yeah, like same. I'm doing yeah. a video right now. And I had an audio issue I needed to fix. I got on YouTube, found a video that was two minutes long. That's how easy the fix was. Yeah. <laughs> Watch. So people come to YouTube to learn. So if I treat YouTube like an academy and not a vlog, then okay. I see myself as a teacher, right? Yeah. At the academy, my channel is meant to be educational because mm. all of YouTube, the only reason we get on YouTube is to learn um, or be entertained through learning or, or you know, experiencing things like that. Number two thing I've learned about YouTube compared to other social media is that people are on YouTube with their wallets open. We get on YouTube to research things we want to buy, to learn from people like that. YouTube is like, if I want to watch a review, if I, if I want to look at like buying something, I'm going to watch reviews on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So because I'm coming to YouTube already positioned to buy something, then I've tried to make my channel and why I think my digital shop has had so much success this year is I want to make it like easy and compelling that if you're looking for something like this, the what I'm offering you will help you along your way. And I think when you treat YouTube as a academy and as a storefront, then all you're having to do now is teach people and a byproduct of that is closing a sale. You know what I mean? And so like, and it's not, I, I hope your listeners don't hear this as like Dave's doing YouTube to manipulate people into buying <laughs> stuff. Well, it's not like that, but like, People genuinely want to support my channel, and this is how they support my channel. And it's been really cool. So do you think for travel-based YouTube videos like myself, accounts, do you think people watch them because they just want to be part of the experience of going to that place because maybe it's slightly unattainable for them? So they feel like if – because my latest YouTube is about going to the micronations in Europe, right, San Marino – Monaco and Vatican mm-hmm. City. Now, a lot of people listening going, oh, well, where are those countries? What are those? But do you think people try and find places that they just want to go to in their mind, but maybe either get help of how to do it, but also be part of it through someone else? And then my next question would be then yeah. you would have to be personable to that person for them to like you, right? To come back and watch your stuff. Yeah. So I would say like every maybe five to 10 videos of mine is a location, maybe actually probably every 10. 
video is like location based. I'm trying to do more of those because they're so successful on my channel. So yeah. I, I ask myself the same question, like who's watching this and why, mm. right? Um, are they watching it because they'll never experience it and this is how they can, right? I don't, I don't think necessarily that is my channel. Um, mm -hmm. I think people that watch travel, um, that watch travel videos about locations or about the art, they are researching either without, mm -hmm. even if they don't realize it, you're inspiring them to go there and they're plotting their route, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so like I, the video I just, that just has over 5,000 views in two days for me, which is big for my channel. Like that, that's yeah. for 6,000 subs. That, that's a big, yeah. that, that video is doing really well. That was me doing a road trip through the desert of California and hitting desert locations. Right. It's a 30 minute video, which is against all YouTube norms, right? Because yes. YouTube yeah. 12 minutes, do 12, 12 minute minutes. Videos. Yeah. <laughs> my biggest videos of 2023 were half hour videos of oh, me wow. traveling to cool locations. That's great. Tonight. I mean, one of them. One I put out a couple months ago is over 50,000 views now. Um, that's my number one video of the year, 30 minutes long. I thought it was going to do horrible because it was 30 minutes and it's mm -hmm. been my biggest one. But what I'm doing is I'm showing people locations that either they are already looking at, like trying to find cool spots. I do that. I get If I'm going to a place, I get on YouTube, try to find yeah. cool spots. Mm -hmm. um, or they're watching it and they're getting stoked because they're like, I need to go see that. Mm -hmm. And now they're writing it down on their list. So I treat my, my viewers as if they're planning to come here. So I'm always like, hey guys, like, okay, so you're, if you're heading up, like, okay, the video I just did, I passed a volcanic field that you would not know was there unless you researched the area. You drive right by this giant red mound, it's a giant anthill. You would never know it's a volcano. Mm -hmm. You would never know that if you get off the road and you go down a dirt road for 10 minutes, you come to a dried up lake bed where the lava rock just runs into the lake bed. And then like <laughs> you had this texture where yeah. like, it's dry lake bed and lava rock meet each other. It's really cool. You would never know that's there. So on my channel, I'm like, I'm here at this place. Here's how you get to this place. You're driving up. You see this thing. You turn right on Cinder Road. You come down 10 minutes and you're here. Look at this place. Look how cool this is. So I'm doing it from an educational standpoint because I'm I'm assuming my viewers are going to try to come here someday rather than you'll never be here. So let me tell you how cool it is. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you're never, you'll never make it to this place. But I get viewers from, I get a lot of international viewers that are like, I'm planning a trip to California. I would have never known about this. This is amazing. Like I, 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 I treat everybody on my channel as if they're making plans to come here themselves. And I talk to them as if they're planning on their own trip. I think I tried to make mine slightly entertaining. So there's not comedy in there, but you know, bit tongue in cheek sometimes, but also educational. I think that's what I mm -hmm. tried to aim for anyway. But you're right about the 12 minutes though. There've been 12 minutes pretty much my YouTube videos, but one yesterday was 25 minutes, the first long one. Um, so see how that does. <laughs> and you mentioned earlier about you do mentor people um, to yeah. be a freelancer. So how does that work? And what do you offer? And how can people maybe get interested in that? Part of that, like cultural value, generosity, right? That we were talking about earlier. Um, I try to be overly generous with information and resources. So if anyone asks me a question, I answer them. I get mm -hmm. emails every day through YouTube, through my website. Um, I, I get comments every day on my YouTube channel. I try to reply to every comment. I don't know how that's going to scale, but I oh, did it when wow. I had 100 subs and I do it at 6,000 subs. There's like passive mentorships, which is like someone comes to me, they ask me a question. I always try to, to, to give a response. Mm -hmm. And then there's like intentional things that are more in person that are like, hey, like, if you're in the Bay Area, like I provide opportunities to connect and go do stuff. So like if I'm doing a shoot in San Francisco, I'll put out to my followers, hey, guys, you might want to come shoot, hit me up. I'll tell you where I'll be. And then they come, they ask me questions like we do things together like that. I've developed great friendships through that. And then I have like personal by people that that like have one to one, like we do a lot together because I'm helping them grow in their own craft and skill. And that's a very intentional, like a long-term, you know, thing. But I would say like, at the end of the day, it's all just like being generous with enough, with your time to make yourself available and, and, and honestly answer questions, not try to gatekeep, not try to like, hmm. oh shoot, like here's this one thing that's working for me. I'm going to protect it. So no one else does it. That's yeah, competitive. Yeah. You know, that's it, collaboration yeah. is better than competition every day of the week, you know? And so, um, so yeah, so I try to just be overly generous with um, access to, to myself, to my time and, and always give truthful, honest answers to help other people. I, and, and if someone, 
if someone takes my advice or my my resources and does better with it than I did, then that's not that's not on them. They didn't do me wrong. I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need to do better myself. Then you know, <laughs> the self evaluation. But Simon Sinek said on the podcast I watched that there's always someone better. So mm-hmm. that's a almost a fruitless task that you have to be the best because there's enough space for everyone. I think in certain industries. 100%. Right? Yeah, I think yep. once you get your even YouTube, if you if you just have one or two thousand subscribers and that community are intent on helping you, supporting you, they might even buy stuff from you. Well, that's already enough to get going, right? That's that's more than 100%, enough that you've got yeah. going. Yeah, you don't need millions. Yeah, I, I think I think like. This is a game of Game of Thrones quote here, <laughs> but um, what it what it uh I forget the name of the characters, but um, he said, "Is it better to be a king or a kingmaker?" There are there are days where like, man, it feels good if you're the king, right? It feels good to like be the <laughs> yeah. guy and like right. <laughs> you know you're you're ruling, you're you got you got all the influence, you got all the deals, you get all the opportunities. But at the end of the day, it feels better when you lay your head down at night. For me, at least, knowing that I help somebody become a king, you know, yeah. um, I rather have a resume of people that made it because I played a role in their success than to lay down at night and be successful at the expense of others with a wake yeah. of bodies behind me. I'll yeah. never be that person. And so I try to I try to have that mentality, you know, like I want to help people like be the king, be be their own kings and queens and, and make yeah. it in their own respect. And, and what you said is right. There's room for everybody at the top. It, I was I was playing this um at an um uh, we do this event in San Jose called Creator Night. We get a bunch of creators together from different mediums. Mm-hmm. And um it's an awesome event. I host it. So I, I kind of lead a panel and um we were talking about collaboration over competition. That was a theme for the one we did one of yeah. the ones we did in the fall. You know, as we're as we're talking about all that you know, it's like at the end of the day, there's room like n- nobody, nobody has one band they listen to and they only listen to that band. Yeah. Sure. You know, yeah. nobody, we have artists, we have genres of music we like, mm. and we listen to a plethora of artists or songs within that genre. Like companies are the same way. Yeah. Some companies will prefer working with one photographer over another, but that's because they like the person, mm. you know, they've got, yeah, yeah. they've got a relationship with the person, mm. but like, brands people that get family portraits the whole everything in the whole creative world there's room for everyone to go out there like you're nobody i, I don't ever say i have competition i don't have, believe i have competition my competition is me yeah, like yeah my lazy yeah, yeah, same my apathy yeah, so. that's my competition <laughs> it's not the photographer down the street no if i build that photographer up that's awesome i'm not yeah. competing with that photographer because he can't do what i do and i can't do what he does or she does i'm my i'm my competition and I think that like there's room for everybody to be successful in the creative world if you work hard at it. Because if you work hard at it, it all comes down to niche because everyone is different. So mm-hmm. if you've got 10 photographers shooting the same thing, there's still going to be nuance there in each photo because of the way you maybe shoot the camera, the make different camera you want to use yep. or the preset or whatever it is. So like, there has to be yep, room for definitely. everyone because no one's the same anyway. I just got back home that that trip I went on. I was mentioning the YouTube video I just released. Like that was with two other photographers, right? Um, When it comes to following, I was the middle guy. There's one guy who has 10 times my following. Yeah. Then there's a guy who I got six times his following, right? We're all there shooting together. We had a blast. We have a group text. We never once felt competitive because we're not competing. We're friends yeah. and we're, we're texting each other, our own photos of the exact same place as we were. And they're so vastly different. It's, it's really wild. Like to look at the three of us and see our, our independent galleries of what we shot in the exact same location at the exact same time, experiencing yeah. the exact same thing. And we got three totally different stories from it, mm. but yet we champion each other. You know what I yeah. mean? And that, that's what it's all about. Has to be the way forward. I, I, I can't see yeah. any other way. Yeah. Um, that sort of competition is, is weird, but maybe that's related to the society we're in, but that's another, I think you mentioned the, yeah, yeah. the capitalism <laughs> comment earlier. That's another sure. real conversation. Um, okay. And uh, I want to touch on a bit of travel as well, just quickly, as it's a travel podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, sure. Specifically, <laughs> uh, what are some of, you mentioned you've been off out shooting in the US. What are some of the, maybe your favorite parts of the US to shoot in, like maybe states or national parks that you love, even going back to maybe? Yeah. 
Um, I love the West. So basically, when you hit the Rockies and go West, that to me is my favorite part of the U.S. Um, everything, like if you were to just draw a line from Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, just go straight down and go West, that to me is like where you'll find me. Um, I don't really go East anymore. Um, I rarely shoot on the East at all. Mm -hmm. um, so if I was giving you like my top three favorite experiences in the U.S., um, a sunrise in the Grand Tetons, it's hard oh. to beat that. Like yeah. if you're at... Specifically, um, if you go to Snake River Overlook and you wait for the sun to come up on a clear day, when the horizon on the east is clear, that's one of the best experiences in the U.S. you can have. I would say sunset in Zion National Park at the Watchmen, which is a bridge looking at a mountain called the Watchmen. Mm -hmm. Sunset there when the uh, west sky is clear, hard to beat that. Um, tunnel view in Yosemite National Park um, for a sunset, also incredibly hard to beat that. Sunrise and Glacier uh, at Wild Goose Island, hard to beat yeah. that. Um, so like, uh, for me, it's a lot of the national parks, but it's not because they're national parks, it's they're national parks because they're beautiful, untouched land, you yes. know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's like, people think cart and horse a lot of times, they get them backwards. Like, it's not that I, I love the national parks, but I love them because they're untouched, protected land that is ancient at this point, you know? Mm. it's um. If you look at my photographs, like it's funny, there's a big UK photographer, James Popsy, and he's he's like, he's the, he's amazing, right? Love that guy. I love watching his channel. And he talks about like, his passion is he loves to shoot landscapes with human elements in it. So he had a photo okay. where like it's beautiful green meadow and then there's a soccer goal, like a football. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. like, that's his thing. Like he loves beautiful natural landscapes with human elements. I'm the complete opposite. I try to capture landscapes as if people had never even stepped foot there. I almost have like a Lewis and Clark, like I think of the pioneers as they're coming West and the <laughs> first time they saw this place, like if they took a photo, what would it have been? So I try to hide all human activity. So for that reason, like the places that I'm drawn to are a lot of the protected lands, national parks, state parks, wildernesses, mm. because they are untouched by humanity. And I bet if I could put on, you know, some glasses and see a thousand years ago, they might not be that different. You know, they might... Mm. It might not look that different than I'm experiencing right now. And there's something about that when I travel that I'm so drawn to. So you'll find me in places that have little human impact um, or human impact that I can hide so I can experience it as it was experienced by the first human eyes. That makes sense? Yeah. So what I was going to add to that is you're very interested with that because I am the same for nature. So I don't want any human beings involved. I got this great shot mm -hmm. in Yellowstone last year where it was like quite far out of your platform. The colors were amazing. Elk were just there. You can see the elk in the distance. But then you got people mm -hmm. just like with their cameras to the left and like, ah, oh, I can't get them yeah. out of the shot. So it's a little bit annoying. But what I also find fascinating with human interactions is if it's specifically about humans, you know, if they're if you capture someone having a coffee in a cafe with mm -hmm. their friends and they're laughing, you get that shot. I love that as well because it's a time in it's a moment yeah. in time where they're in they're in action. There's no. I don't, I don't know what the word is that, that it's natural. That's what they're doing. It's not, not, not mm -hmm. forced. Um, but I wouldn't want like that coffee to happen in the middle of like Yellowstone. Uh, yeah, if it's right. like a cafe in yeah. an East coast, yeah, fine. I get it. That's, that's, that's what I like, but, uh, yeah. yeah so that's where sure. I'm at with photography, I think. Yeah, definitely. So for, so for me, like I will travel or I will recommend travel to places where you can feel ancient. Yes. Yeah. And there's something magical about that. Do you ever look mm -hmm. at photos and just think they're better than reality? Does that ever come into your mind? Yeah, more now than ever because of AI. <laughs> um, yeah. It was funny. I remember the first time there was a photo that inspired me to go somewhere. It was actually on um, Alabama Hills here in California. Yeah, I saw a photo years ago. I mean, that's, have you been there before? It's an incredible place, yeah. right? It's, all, it's on the desert side of California, looking at the Sierras on the east side, sharp, jagged mountains. I mean, they, those mountains are so ancient, like beautiful place. Mm. But I remember the photo that inspired me to go was a guy standing on a rock with this towering mountain in the background. So I go years later, I'm there finally for the first time. And I, was, I had saved that photo on my Instagram and I'm looking at it. And then I realized that's not real. What he <laughs> had done was he had taken that mountain and elongated it up in Photoshop to give it more of a point, more of a jagged edge. Because I'm like, this mountain's a little shorter and fatter than it looks in that photo. <laughs> but like, regardless though, like it's still like this incredible place. And so it's easy today to, to think, is this real? 
Like, mm. I mean, I feel like more than ever, we are starting to question, you know, places. But I think the I don't ever want to call art good and bad. It's a spectrum. It's a spectrum yeah. of real. Yeah. It's like I, I always uh, tell people with photography, photography is a spectrum of purely art and purely journalistic, right? News stuff you're going to see in newspapers. There's mm. very little editing in that. It's as yeah. it was right? Mm -hmm. We're capturing a moment as it was. And on the other side, you got the guy who took the photo and elongated the mountain. He made art. Mm -hmm. If you start looking for art in real life, you're going to be disappointed. Um, But if you go somewhere with the intent to be an artist, no matter what you experience, whether it's the guy in the coffee shop or having coffee or this giant mountain view, if you go there with the intent to be an artist, I don't think you're ever disappointed. Mm. Okay. Interesting outlook. Okay. Uh, What about international travel? Do you have any, like, I normally ask three countries that you'd love traveling to, could be for work, could be for pleasure, that you've experienced. Yeah, I'm hesitant to call Canada international here in North America. <laughs> that's, that's on my list. I love going to Canada. Yeah, it's um, allowed. It's I, allowed. Love, <laughs> I love everything about Canada. If okay. I could relocate to Canada, I'd be up there. Um, oh, really? Interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, America's a hot mess right now. I dream about <laughs> moving to Europe or moving to the to Canada. Um, but anyway, uh so yeah, Canada, I put on my international list, but specifically Alberta and and uh in British Columbia. I just love the mountains as as beautiful as our mountains are in the US, as they go north into Canada, they just get better and better. Yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah. Uh I've got family in Italy. And so I've spent a lot of my life um in and out of Italy, visiting, you know, seeing family or traveling Italy. I've been all over that that country. And specifically though, like the the Southern Alps and to the Dolomites, like mm. that part of Europe is incredible. Uh, it's funny. I've never been to the UK outside the airport. Um, and I've got all these people there that I want to connect with other photographers that we just are good friends online. Uh, yeah. I'm planning to go to be this year and for like a week. Um, but, uh, you know, I've been in the Middle East, been all over Europe. Um, I've done the hot spots like Iceland and, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know if I'll do that again. Um, <laughs> But I, and I've never really, I've never really gone south much. I've always drawn north. I'm drawn to oh, cold weather. I'm drawn to big mountains. Um, I've never really done much in South America. I've never done Africa. I've never done Australia, New Zealand, yeah. even though I'd love to do. I've never done any of those. So, you know, if I, my top three nations would be like Canada, probably like Austria, Switzerland, that area in Northern Italy, um, I think is just incredible. And then I spent a few days just traveling Ireland, um, which oh, is yeah. a very, it's a very empty nation. <laughs> like yeah four million people are, yeah <laughs> yeah i mean like but they're just on the coast <laughs> like yeah i drove the interior of ireland and i and for me being drawn to like that ancient landscape you yeah. know like seeing things as it was with no human interaction i felt like i got a lot of that in ireland so i really love that i got a lot of that in iceland too but iceland mm. it was hard to find food <laughs> there's like no yeah, restaurants no, anywhere it's no like, one there you can't find anything. <laughs> like yeah. you are you you better be prepared People think I'm going to go to Iceland and drive Ring Road. Well, my wife and I did that, yeah. and we almost starved one day because we couldn't find anywhere to get food. <laughs> it's empty, completely empty. So yeah, oh, okay. yeah. International though, like I, I love Europe. I go to Europe as often as I can. I'll probably be back there sometime this year. Mm. Um, so yeah, love it. This is a patron shout out to Laura from the Swamp Soup Stickers, who has contributed five pounds to the podcast on my Patreon. Thank you so much for your support. Really appreciate it, and it helps the podcast to keep going in the future. If you're interested, head to the show notes where you'll find a link to my patron. The website address is patreon.com forward slash Wigan Air Travel Podcast. For five English pounds, you will receive some trendy stickers from myself in the post, a shout out on each episode, and also my digital travel planner by email. Thank you for your support. For a photographer, if you come to UK, surely it's got to be Scotland. That's I can't wait. Be, yeah, that's got to be yeah. a photographer's dream. I think. Yeah. Um. That. Yeah, I've never been. Road right at the top. Yeah, I islands. cannot wait to do that. I, no I'm one there. No. Yeah. Oh, do you know what? I've never been to Scotland. I've been to Edinburgh. It doesn't really count. Um. So mm. I need to go to Scotland, and I think I'd love it up there. Actually, yeah, it's really nice. But UK is a bit of a mess as well. So. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what isn't the whole world is right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, what projects are you working on right now as we go into 2024? Honestly, after my 2023 with YouTube and how well things went with the channel um, mm-hmm. and the connection, the community that I've been able to, to have through that channel, 
as well as my own like digital photography shop where I sell presets and like my own like custom looks and everything. I I feel like the spark is there. So I'm spending 2024 putting as much energy into YouTube as possible. Oh, same. Uh, okay, nice. It, for me, it's like, it's, it's, it's a good use of my time. Um, I'm in control of what I shoot versus like client work. Um, I'm actually saying no right now to most client work. So I can focus on YouTube. Um, I go out and shoot the things I want to shoot. Yeah. And then I talk about the camera, the brand that I use and all these things. And uh, yeah. So like, I'm, I'm honestly right now, this is 2024 is the year of YouTube for me. So I'm going to see at the end of the year, if things are not sustainable or not going well, then I'll pivot. Like I, you know, like as any creative Mm -hmm. does, and I'm not going, I'm not like cutting off my family to be able to do this. Uh, I've got, you know, obviously have other things going on, but the YouTube trajectory right now is going really well. So I'm giving as much time and energy to it as possible. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm the same. I love it. I just love editing video. I think it's great. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I'm learning something every time I do it. So I'm like, oh yeah, that needs to change. Yeah, I'm same. Like, and then I forget that thing. Then I have yeah. to go on YouTube and watch, watch how to again. do that thing again. <laughs> yeah. And then do it again. Yeah. YouTube is is for me 2024 as well, as, as well as my books. I think we're on the same line there. Okay. And I just want to ask about, as we wrap up here, I've got some questions at the end, that sort of a feature, which is quite fun. But before that, can you also tell us about your book that you've written? Because I know you mentioned that before, um, what, what, what it is and where people can maybe find it. Yeah, I mean, get on Amazon. Um, it actually was published by a third party publisher. And I don't know, I would never do that again. Um, oh, okay, interesting. So I learned a lot. I, I would have <laughs> self-published. If I can go back and do it again, I'd self-publish. Really? Um, Wow. Yeah, yeah. And just leverage my own network rather than like having someone purchase the manuscript or partner on the manuscript and having it was it was published by Harper Collins yeah. and they published it through one of their smaller publishers because they own you know big they're they're a big publishing company that owns mm. a ton of small publishers so like they're the parent company and they published it through this other one and then during the pandemic they shut that other one down so if I'm honest with you I have no clue. What happened like it's still being sold but i have no idea how to track down anybody from a technical standpoint oh uh, that has my book <laughs> so <laughs> big mess working on it big mess it is available yeah. it's called father in the wild and what the book is about is about kind of like i mentioned that early on in this podcast i grew up kind of in poverty we lived living living in 22 homes being very nomadic um, it didn't really have my father in my life very present. What it did was it in it, it ingrained in me a sense of like uh, abandonment that it led me to give um, too much trust and give too much of my life in anyone as a as a young man that would like present themselves as caring for caring for me. And then what that did was that created a pattern of. I finally found someone that cares about me. Oh crap, they let me down. Mm. I suck. Oh, here's another person. Oh, I they let me down. And then I started repeating that on on basically a repeat, you know, constantly, whether it was bosses, mentors, um, you know what I mean? Just like as a as a teenager and a young man, it was like I'm looking for this like father or looking for this person who's going to like guide me through life. And then never had it, you know? And so as I, as I became myself and as, you know, I became my own, I became a father, I've got children and a family and my wife and I've been married 13 years now. Um, But as I became my own like father, I started thinking about like, well, my father is really just the wild. It's what all the things I discovered. I, I, I found a lot of my security and a lot of who I am um by being in the wild it's 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 kind of a fun it's a fun thought it's kind of a sad thought kind of a fun thought but i heard this quote and the book is really based around this quote that i heard because I, I went through like some therapy for all this back when i was in 2008 2009 and um i spent a week at this place um that doesn't exist anymore sadly i wish it did it was a ranch in colorado this old this older guy he was a re- basically a retired therapist mm-hmm. he built a ranch and middle of nowhere. When I say Colorado, we're not talking Denver, Colorado Springs. We're talking like in the middle of the mountains, near nobody, secluded, no cell phone service, nothing. Um, but he immerses you in beauty. And he said this thing the first day I was there. 
uh, two things greatly affect the heart, beauty and adversity. And, and I, I, I've everything about my life moving forward has hung on that, that quote that like adversity affects our heart, but equally beauty affects our heart. Mm. So your degree of going through adversity also is a degree in which you need beauty. And so I set out after that experience and I traveled all over the West over many years. Um, I, like kind of just like every chance I got, I went somewhere beautiful. So the book kind of tells the story of like spiritual healing that happens when you immerse yourself in beautiful places and the things that you learn about yourself and the things that get fixed inside you by watching a sunrise in this location. So the, the book takes a snapshot of my life from like 09 to like 13. And it just kind of like dives into the thoughts and processes of what it was like to experience like that kind of healing in nature in beautiful places. Okay. And people can find that on your website as well. I think, I think, I think, yeah, I think Lena Moore's site, it's available on Amazon, wherever you buy books, it's likely available. Although I have no idea how many are sold anymore. (laughs) So (laughs) I have no idea. Yeah. I'll track it down eventually. Yeah, my, my website is like the easiest site in the world to remember. My name is Dave, and my website is dave.online. Um, oh, I was okay. able to secure that domain. Wow. You remember, wow. you remember wow. everything was .com for a long time, and they yeah. released like 100 different dots? Well, when they did that, I bought dave.online for like 30 bucks. Had it for <laughs> a while now. Um, so yeah, dave.online is kind of the hub to all the things I'm, I do, whether it's uh, my photography, video work, mm. YouTube, writing. Uh, there is a newsletter on that. I don't send things out too often uh, because I don't like to spam people with things I don't need. Mm. Um, so, but if you do sign up, uh, that's a great way. So whenever there's something that's worth like me talking about to the massive amount of people on that, <laughs> that list, I'll send it out maybe three or four times a year. Otherwise, like social media is a great way to keep up with what I got going on, whether it's um, you know, YouTube or Instagram or you know, mm. threads, or whatever. Your YouTube is Dave Herring. Yep. Yeah, yep. just my name. Yep. Yep. Dave Herring. Yep. I'll put the links in there and social media. Yep. Uh Instagram is probably one of the most present on, uh, mm-hmm. which is at Dave Herring. So it's just okay. my name. Cool. Yep. I'll pop them in the show notes and make sure people can access you as quickly as possible. So we're gonna finish the yeah. episode on some quick fire travel questions. So what I normally All do right, here is I ask people top three favorite things, different genres, different type of things, quick fire. What first comes to your head? It's travel question time. Um, I'm actually going to start with not a multiple one. It's just a straight question. How many countries have you traveled to? Oh, gosh. This must be fast. Ballpark figure. <laughs> uh, one, two, three. Uh, uh, how many countries are in Europe? <laughs> Europe, mo- most of Europe, plus most of North America. <laughs> or all of North America, <laughs> most of Europe. 50? Whatever that number ends up being. Yeah, and the Caribbean. Oh, I don't, oh know. God. <laughs> I don't know. Like I don't know, maybe twenty ish. Okay, twenty. Okay, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's go with that. Let's say twenty. <laughs> and what three countries have you not traveled to that you'd love to go to next? Uh New Zealand is number one. It's just so far away. Yeah. Um, um Uh, probably like Norway. That's a European nation. Yeah. Never been in. Would love yeah. to go to Norway. Uh, and the UK. I've never been to the UK. <laughs> Definitely come to the UK. Those are my top three. <laughs> okay, and top three favorite international cuisines. Oh man, it's hard to for me. It, German food. Um, give me some some schnitzel. I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. or uh, Italian food as well. Um, I love the street pizza in Italy, like the stuff you buy on the oh, street, yeah. not the restaurant oh. stuff, the street stuff. Man, that's where it's at. Yeah. Um, and then I also love like Mexican food uh, in the U.S. Tex Mex. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, it's a slight tinge on it. Well, no, in California, we have real Mexican food. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah I, I accept. Okay, and three favorite states to travel in? Uh, California, Oregon, and Washington, <laughs> the West Coast. Okay, and what two states haven't you been to? I didn't ask that. Uh, in, the, in the continental U.S., I've never been in Mississippi or Louisiana. What about top three favorite cities? Um, favorite cities? Uh, I love the Bay Area, so I'm going to be partial and say San Francisco. Um, I love uh, Bozeman, Montana. 
Oh, um, okay. Fun, fun yeah. little town, okay. Bozeman, Montana. Yeah. Um, man, I'm, I just have to say Jackson, Wyoming, too. I love Jackson, Wyoming. Really small town. You got really out Jack- there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, three favorite mountain ranges. Three favorite mountain ranges. Um, the Canadian Rockies, uh, the Dolomites, and then the Sierras. Easy, easy peasy. Awesome. <laughs> and you like your coffee. So if you could sit somewhere yes. and have a cup of coffee for the afternoon and just watch the world go by, where are you going to sit? Oh, man, I had a cup of coffee in the Dolomites at some little like restaurant or little bar. I don't remember even where it was, but it was on top of a mountain range. And I just sat there for like we were there for like three hours just sitting there watching clouds go by. That was a moment. I would do that again. <laughs> Best thing about that area, they're so cheap. So like when you go to Italy, so you have like yeah. a one euro coffee. It's proper coffee. Yes, but the people don't realize amazing. like the Dolomites are like one of the most beautiful places in the yeah. world, and you can really go there with twenty euros and be <laughs> good to go for the day. It's, it's oh, wild. Okay, and what about a country they've experienced is the best for your budget? So where does the dollar go the furthest? Greece. Agreed. The cheap. dollar goes so far in Greece. I was in Greece for a shoot this past summer for ten days. We were eating as a family of five, which is me and my wife, our friend, and our and then the two kids. We were eating all five of us at restaurants, nice restaurants for like fifteen to twenty euros. Um, transportation there super yeah. cheap. We were in the we weren't on touristy islands. We were like in Athens, and then we were in an island called Patmos uh, where the shoot was. And like we literally, we go get massive amounts of food for like four euros each. Like it was incredible. Yeah. yeah. Greece, okay. you'll get a lot of bang for your buck. Love Greece. If you could live somewhere for one year, anywhere in the world, apart from USA, and I'm probably going to exclude Canada as well because I think you love it. Where yeah. are you going to live? <laughs> I'm probably going to live in like the Austrian Alps. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, Innsbruck, that area. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Small yeah. enough, small enough that like, you know, you can kind of do your thing big enough that you have everything you need. Okay. Yeah, Austrian Alps all day. What about top three favorite lakes? Favorite lakes. Um, I'm gonna go with Moraine up in Banff. That lake is like oh. just so beautiful. Yeah. And I, I we took a canoe out in that lake one time, and it's like canoeing through Blue Gatorade. It was beautiful. Um, there's a lake in the Tetons. You can hike up to. I forget the name of the lake, but it's at nine thousand feet. Um, and it's another alp. It's like an uh a glacier lake. Uh, I forget the name of it. But it's a hike in the Tetons. If you just Google 9,000 foot lake Tetons, you'll find it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a third one, probably, and I don't know the name of this lake either. On the east side of Mount Rainier, there's a oh, small yeah. lake yeah. that you can get yeah. the mountain reflecting in 24 7. If you stand above it, you see the mountain. It, it's an incredible, beautiful lake. Don't know the name of it. It's not even big enough. It may not even have a name. It's really small. <laughs> but, um, but it is. Just absolutely beautiful, and I could sit sit at that lake all day. I need to do better with my lake names. Yeah, like they're, they're tough because you just you just find them right. Three countries that you put experienced like the nicest people. I'm gonna give you one that no one's gonna expect, and that was France. Like, <laughs> okay, yeah. I well, I I lost. It's funny. I lost my laptop in the f- airport in Charles de Gaulle, and a French woman got up with her friend when I was in Ireland, tracked it down, picked it up for me and mailed it to me, which was awesome. So I think I never had any interactions with French people. And I'm like, wow, French people are the best. Um, So I'll go with France from that experience. Um, Ireland. Oh my gosh. Like, especially in Galway on the West side of Ireland or um, man, I was like, you go out and then like you're at a pub and everyone's your friend. Like that was (laughs) pretty cool. I'm not going to say Italy because that's the opposite. (laughs) <laughs> Even though I have family there, <laughs> I've, had the, I've had the rudest people in Italy. Um, yeah, I would say probably just Canadians are generally good natured, warm, friendly people. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, two more questions. Three favorite like walks, hikes, or treks? Man, it, it's hard to beat a hike in the Tetons. Um, there's a hike to not the lake I mentioned earlier, there's a hike that's kind of family friendly, you can do it with kids. Um, I had to look up the trail name. It starts at Jenny Lake and it goes up to another lake. Um, but it's a beautiful hike. Uh, it's one I would recommend anyone in the Tetons go do. 
um also hiking in yellowstone um specifically mm. in the like lamar valley area where you can see everything around you and you don't have to worry about a grizzly bear getting you or a wolf yeah. um beautiful hikes with a lot of wildlife um yeah i'd recommend like all right I, i'm I'm actually going to be out in jackson two weeks and uh shooting a winter uh thing out in the in the snow up there in yellowstone and um in the tetons uh, and then the third one I would say is Taft Point in Yosemite. Um, it's not an overly complicated hike, but it goes to this incredible view of Yosemite Valley from from the top of the valley rather than the bottom. It's a beautiful hike. That's amazing. Okay, and the last question is going to be a lot of my listeners are obviously travelers or want to be travelers. So what couple of sentences of advice could you give to why someone should travel and get out there and get out of the comfort zone, see some different stuff? meet some different people and kind of embrace that different culture a lot of clarity comes when you break routine and so if you're listening and you're doing the same thing every day you get up at the same time you eat the same food you go to the same job you come home you have the same bedtime it's very easy for a year to go by five years to go by and then you're like what have i done the last five years when you break free of routine and you change the routine up. And the best way to do that is traveling. It's because it's all new experiences. Or even if you've been there before, it's another take on a on an on a, on a experience you've had. You get a lot of clarity. You get a lot of like, it's almost like if you turn your, if you turn not like all the music's off, you're in the shower. It's like the only time you can't be on your phone. You're just, you know what I mean? People get their best ideas in the shower because yeah, they're yeah. finally breaking, they're breaking the day. They're breaking their routine. They're mm-hmm. clearing their mind. I feel like travel is like a long experience like that, where you break the routine, you can find clarity, you can get answers, you can have peace. And again, beauty affects the heart. And so traveling to places that are beautiful to you and inspire you will greatly affect your heart. Awesome. That's a great way to finish the episode today. Thanks for coming on. It's been an awesome chat. Yeah, I have thanks for having me. Learned a lot about the freelance world, the creative world, because I'm a creative at heart. Obviously, I do the podcast, so I feel like we're kind of the same le- wavelength there. And yeah, it's really appreciate oh. your honesty and sharing your sort of life, really, and also your creative projects and how it's all going. And congrats on the YouTube channel this year. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Cheers, dude. Thank you. Thank you for listening to my Winging It Travel podcast episode today. You can find me on Instagram at James Hammond Travel or Winging It Travel podcast. You can search for both. I release weekly clips of this podcast episode as well as photos from the last eight to ten years of my travels. You can also follow me on TikTok, Facebook and Pinterest by searching Winging It Travel podcast. I do release daily content to do with travel and the podcast throughout the week. Also check out my website jameshammond.org. There's content about myself my travels and there's also a newsletter sign up as well as a contact form finally please rate and review the podcast on podchaser this is my platform of choice alternatively you can rate this on apple or wherever you get your podcasts from this really helps the podcast gain a bit of traction for the future in terms of guests and content and i'm glad to see that you guys are listening out there reviewing it and enjoying the content so far stay safe stay humble keep listening keep traveling and i'll catch you soon Cheers, James.